I found it on Rayma Radio. Hi everyone, this is Julia and welcome to Rayma Radio, the weekly podcast on faith, culture, music and more. I'm here with Juita Suito. Hello. And here, welcome to the Jew and Jew show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think um Juita really needs no introduction, but for the benefit of anybody who might be new or who just need a little refresher, Juita is a sinner, s- sinner. <laughs> sinner yes, I'm sorry, correct. a singer extraordinaire. And um, for those of us who remember the Malaysian Idol series not too long ago, she was also the vocal coach on her own. Um, she also does gigs and singing, uh, singing stints all over in Malaysia. And I think recently also in East Malaysia. We'll talk a little bit about that. So thanks so much for being with us, Juita. Oh, such a pleasure. No worries. Now, just wondering, just to give a little bit of background mm-hmm. of how you started this singing journey, did you fall into it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, in the words of my brother, I started singing before I started talking, apparently. I don't know how true that is. Um, but I have fond recollections of uh, performing as a kid. Um, you know, my dad was a pastor. I don't know if that was, uh, in, you know, connected to it, but I was singing for people's weddings lah. <laughs> Um, and they would ask for the weirdest songs for their weddings. I still remember um, there was this couple who asked for um, the song called Siapa Siapa Kadia Sebelum Daku or something like that. Oh I'm like, are you goodness. serious? You want that for your wedding? <laughs> yeah, I know. And I would have been maybe eight, seven. Um, yeah. Uh, my earliest um, uh, memory of a performance was in a school hall. And I was in this, you know, the standard school hall. I was on the stage and all. It, all I could see in front of me was a sea of boys, boys in school uniform. Mm. I don't know what I was, why I was there, what I was doing there. Um, but at the end of it, this kid came up and, well, this kid who was bigger than me, yeah. came up and gave me a bunch of flowers. Oh so that was my first memory of an actual performance. Right, yeah. right. Wow, how did that, so, how did these school performances and wedding performances, it sounds like a young Michael Jackson, right? In his early <laughs> years. No, 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 I cannot compare, but... <laughs> Um, so I suppose that kind of got me started uh, in this world of performing. And then I remember my brother was also a very, very keen musician, even mm-hmm. as, a, as a kid. And he would have his recording projects. Mm-hmm. You know, he would bring um, this four-track recorder. And others of you in music, you would know what it is. It's, just, it's, got, it's, it's got just four tracks. Um, and he would bounce, he would play the piano, and then he would bounce that off. And then he would put uh, bass. You know, he, this one-man band he'd be recording. And he was a teenager at that time. Um, so when it came to the female vocals, that was the only thing that he couldn't do, right? So he's like, Jill, can you come and sing for me? So I ended up singing uh, Whitney songs, uh, Diana Ross songs with him, the duets. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, and I, I think that was while we were in Malacca. So I was below 10, for sure. Hmm. And um, that was my first introduction to the studio setting. It wasn't a studio, it was a, another hall uh, where he just put up a mic. But it's kind of, you know, recording yourself yeah. and listening to what you sound like and knowing whether you're flat or sharp or having enough emotion. Um, that was the very, very beginning. Yeah. I see. And for, uh, for your information, for those of you who don't know, her brother that she's mentioned is Aubrey Suito, who yeah. himself is an accomplished musician. Yep. So music runs in the family. It does. <laughs> how, then, how then did that um, evolve into your calling in, in life now? Wow, huh. that's a long story. <laughs> so, okay, so, I mean, music was always a part of me. I was in children's choir, um, the National Children's Choir, went around performing. So I kind of had a feel of what it might feel like. Did that make sense? Yes. <laughs> you know, um, the behind the scenes kind of thing. I had a feel of that. I saw artists, um, you know, a lot of us see artists as this glamour thing. You watch TV, you... You know, you read you read all these glamour stories about them, you know, but um, I could see the life behind it. It was very, very normal. It, and it wasn't something that, you know, it wasn't something that I was aspiring to it. It wasn't like, oh, I want to be this famous artist. or um, It was just, music was just something that I loved. Um, until the point where uh, I remember there was a time in church where they were talking a lot about um, the seven domains or, you know, the pillars of, of society or whatever you want to call it. And, um, you know, the pastor would preach a lot, a lot, a lot about business, politics, sports, entertainment, education. And I started looking at that whole list. I'm like, business? Oh, you cannot lah. Uh, you know, not, not the business-minded type. Politics, a little bit too much work, you know, you got to go and help collect dead rats. 
uh, <laughs> um, mice. Yeah, family, not married. Uh, <laughs> and all these things, education. I, I do like educating a little bit, um, but I'm not that very structured syllabus kind of person. And I looked at that whole list and I thought, okay, I suppose the only one that I would fit into would be entertainment. And amazingly enough, I think the call for me to pursue music a little bit more seriously came from church. So <laughs> a lot of times it's the other way around, for, but for me it was this, this way around. Right. Yeah. You mentioned that you were growing up in Malacca. I grew up in Malacca. Okay. And then from there, um, you're based here in KL now. So okay. So, so my dad was a Methodist minister, so I practically grew up in church. Uh, Methodist ministers get posted to different churches, different states, different cities. So um, when I was 10, we moved to Sentul. Yeah. When I was 15, we moved to Klang. Okay. And then dad retired. And then I think after A-levels, uh, we moved back to KL. Did that move uh, from, from Malacca over to the city where we are now? Um, you know, a, a city with lots more life and bustling things. Did that open the doors for you? Um. In a way, yes, because when I was in KL, uh, that's when I got, you know, my school sent me for auditions for the National Children's Choir. I don't know what I was doing, just, you know, 11 years old, let's do this audition, yay! Uh, um, so that was one, you know, one um, training ground. Right. Uh, and then my brother had already started working in the music line, and so we had this youth group in church called the Grey Singers. Now, I don't know if you're old enough to remember. Um, I was the youngest kid in... They were all young adults, and I would have been maybe, I don't know, 11, 12, 13, uh, singing with these young adults. Or, well, yeah, older youth. <laughs> yeah. And um, so that was another season of performing, as a group, like, as a vocal group, performing, ministering in churches. Uh, we even have a, a, had an, a recording I think it was a gift of love, yeah, on a cassette. Wow, you wow. know, on a cassette. On a cassette. Yeah, that itself <laughs> says right. Yeah, so I mean, all those count a lot. I think as experience, because I I've got a lot of friends who sing really well, they perform very well, but when they enter a studio, it's a very alien feeling for them, and they find it very hard to, um, you know, get that that vibe. You know, it's very different when you perform on stage with a live audience, and then you're in the studio. It's so sterile, it's so quiet. All you can hear is yourself, your breathing and everything's just, you know, just over, over, what, what, what's amplified? Amplified. Yes, that's the word. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I totally so, know that feeling myself. Hmm. Interesting. So we, so we've covered the backstory of Juwita Suwito and her growing up years. We'll be right back in a short while. On what was the turning point in her career? We'll come back. Hi friends in Kuala Lumpur, this is Sydney Mohiri from JPCC and I cannot wait to be with all of you on the 26th of August at 7.30pm at Kuala Lumpur Baptist Church and we're just going to worship Jesus and lift His name on high. So be there and let's worship Jesus together. Hi, this is Heidi from Refuge for the Refugees. We're always in need of volunteers. So if you're free on Monday to Fridays from 9am to 4pm, come join us and volunteer with us. If you're keen to volunteer with us, write in to us at refugefortherefugees at gmail.com. And we're back to the Jew and Jew show. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so here we are with Juwita Suito. And uh, just before we left, we were talking about um, her journey as from a young performer, growing up to her teenage years, um, and moving up to KL. Now, Juwita, what was then the turning point um, of of your career? What were some of the highs during the musical journey? Wow, good question. <laughs> okay, so as I said earlier, I never thought of doing this uh, full time. Uh, Actually, I didn't start doing this full-time until five years ago. But um, the doors suddenly flung open um, when I was, I was having a full-time job. And I had this offer to do uh, a recording contract um, from a recording company in Taiwan. So it's a new company. And I don't know why they wanted to sign me on. Because <laughs> I, I, I had sung a demo uh -huh. uh, for a song that they liked. And then they said, hey, you know, why don't we get the artist along? Would you like... Would you like be interested to come on on board our record label as an artist? Um, that was really really weird because I speak no Mandarin, I speak no Chinese. I can't even speak Cantonese. Living in Kiel so long, and I'm Hokkien. I can't even speak Hokkien. <laughs> <laughs> was this breathe again? Um, 
No, it was part of a full. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, so I recorded a demo for this song. And then they wanted me to come over and record um, a series of albums. Hmm. So it was a five-year contract. And I thought about it, prayed about it. I thought, hmm, this is, you know, never thought about it. But if a company in Taiwan wants this non-Mandarin speaker person to come, there must be something... Right. Worth considering, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or they they must have seen something that was you know worth exploring. Um, so I remember praying about it, and uh, the story of Abraham came to mind. You know, and God said, "Leave your family, leave your possessions, leave your comfort zone, leave what you're you know comfortable with, and go to this place that I'm calling you to." And I thought, okay, let's let's try this, let's do this. Um, so when I went there, I had um, I asked God for two things. <laughs> yeah. I asked God for a friend, well, two friends. Sorry. One who was from this area, as in Malaysian, yeah. Singaporean, that we could you know talk like because I would be struggling in Mandarin, right? So at least I could have <laughs> regular conversations uh, with somebody from this this side of of the world. Um, that was one, and the other one I asked for a uh, a Christian friend, mm. somebody that. I could walk along with me, you know, in the journey. Um, turns out my my housemate, when I got there, I saw this housemate, and she was, in the morning when I woke up, she was having this big, thick book on the table, mm-hmm. and she was writing stuff. And I'm looking and I'm thinking, I think she's journaling. I think she's doing a quiet time. Oh my gosh, my housemate's a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> so he gave you a two-in-one. And she's from Singapore. <laughs> oh, wow. So I'm like, yes, two-in-one. There was another person that walked with me through the journey, um, a Taiwanese, a pastor's wife, actually. So it's like, wow, God, you're so amazing. So, you know, a little, these are signs along the way that, hey, I'm with you. Um, so the interesting thing was, there was this girl, her name is Brenda Tan. She released her album. Uh, that's that's my housemate I was talking about. Mm-hmm. Another Malaysian friend, he released his album. Then it was time for my release. And somehow it never happened. So we went into studio, recorded half half the album pretty much. And then um, we had a break. So I said, okay, how about I come back to Malaysia and um, that's, you know, for a holiday. And then I'll come back when you're ready to finish the thing. Right. So I was in KL uh, waiting for them to... <laughs> arrange for the return and to complete the album and everything and uh, it was one delay after another right. you know? so I would call so hey should I you know should we get the tickets to go back and then he's like uh, maybe next month why don't you like enjoy yourself first like okay so I mean at first it's like yay right yeah. and then it gets it gets longer and longer and you're like what's going on so this process really dragged out for almost a year more than a year and uh, it was a five year recording contract so I was in a bit of a limbo because is this going through? And then you've got this whole self-doubt, self-questioning thing. Um, did I not study my Mandarin good enough? Do they not like me? Do they... Yeah. Was it the same for Brenda and the other? No, no they, they had already done that. Yeah, this. video, everything, album out and everything. So it was, yeah, it was like, I'm the third one and I'd seen how their process went through, but it didn't go that way for me. You know, mm. and so you're having all these like, am I too fat, <laughs> right? Mm. Seriously, or um, like, wow, all these all these questions that you know, oh, did I say something wrong? Mm. Um, and then you would meet people, you would meet friends here, and who have sent you off on this, yay, congratulations, you've got this recording contract. You know, when you you know remember us when you're famous, that kind of thing. <laughs> and then now you've got the click click moment. Yes, the click click moment. You know, and then you see them in church on Sunday or a cell group, and they're like. So when you're going back, when's your album coming out? And you're like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So that was one of the darkest, most uncertain moments in my life. I couldn't get a job because it's a five-year contract and it's like hanging, right? I'm like, the project is halfway. Um, And it was, yeah. (laughs) Do you know then what happened? Okay, so eventually I discovered that the company was actually having financial problems. So it had nothing to do with me. It was just that moment. I was just caught in in that time frame. Um, but because of that, you know, they say you are the most creative when, at your lowest points. That was when I started writing songs. Hmm. So again, so that, that housemate was a songwriter. She introduced me to how she wrote songs, some of her influences. And I thought, hey, maybe I can do this too, you know. And then when I went through this, you know, this dark season, I started writing songs like Only in the Dark, um, 
you and me, which talks about, you know what, hey, I don't have to prove myself, but God, you know, it's, it's you that makes all the difference. So that was, you know, one of my more prolific area, um, seasons of my life. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and finally, I got myself released from that contract. But for me, it was like almost like a mini schooling in terms of what it takes to to do an album, to record an album, to have a contract, what's in, you know, all this royalties thing. Um, and then the door opened for us to start Oops Asia. So again, if you're old enough, you would know what Oops Asia is. <laughs> I, I am old enough. I Yay. remember. <laughs> so Patrick Leong, right? He's still with Oops Asia and he gave me this call one day and he said, hey, you know, I have this guy who, who wants to, to fund um, music, something to do with music yeah. and, and, and the faith. Yeah. Uh, so we got together over coffee and I had this spiel of of this vision of wouldn't it be awesome, right? If we, you know, had a label that could produce music by Christians that would impact mm. um, the airwaves and the nation and blah, 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 blah. And then Oops Asia got formed. And I can really, really say looking back that this would not have happened if I had not gone for the Taiwan contract because I would have been clueless. I would have been like, huh? What's, you know, mm-hmm. like I would have known nothing about Alien, yeah. about it except I only know the recording bit. I only know how to sing, how to record, but the rest is like really totally alien to me. Okay. Um, eventually, uh, we came out of Oops Asia. I, I came out of Oops Asia mm-hmm. because they wanted to focus solely on um, gospel music, um, mm-hmm. church music. And my calling at that time was very much marketplace. I wanted to impact the radio station. So you would know that here if you sing... Um, well, an explicitly gospel song, chances of it getting aired on radio is very, very slim. And I didn't want to have that wall, you know, I didn't want to have those, mm. those what do you call that? Um, barriers. Barriers, yeah. I wanted to reach um, a bigger, bigger audience. Okay, lovely. We will come right back and where Juita will talk to us a little bit more on what barriers were eventually crossed. Rima. Radio. I'm Pastor Oichinek, founder and president for Ministries of Asia Pacific, in short, MAP. And we have books written, and the sale of these books goes towards mainly the distribution of Bibles. I have two books. One is entitled Turning Faces Towards Heaven, Everyone Can Advance the Gospel. The other one is a commentary style of writing on the Apostle Paul, and the title is uh, Final Reward in Paul's Thought. Both these books are hard copy at 50 ringgit each, and when you purchase them, all the proceeds will go towards the distribution of Bibles for new converts in the rurals of Asia. We have sent about 30,000 copies, and we need to send easily another 90,000 copies for new believers. So you can help by purchase of these books and in the process help in the distribution of Bibles for new converts. You can contact uh, MAP at this number 03-6276-7510 or you can uh, email to MAP at uh, just one letter or short MAP Partners M-A-L MAP Partners M-A-L at gmail.com and through the phone and through the email, if you'd like to arrange for a visit, you want to chat more, you're more than welcome to do so. Thank you. Rayma Radio. All right, and we're back with Juita Suito. We were talking about um, life as you know a recording a recording artist in Taiwan, how you came back, and and your journey in Oops Asia. And after that, how was life after Oops Asia? Because you felt a, you heard a different calling. You were yeah, saying, yeah. Life after Oops Asia. Um, okay, so we started at 440 Records. Uh, it was a good time in the sense that um, my songs were being aired on radio. Uh, we got a lot of good, um, what do you call it, uptake, I think, is that the word? Uh, and I realized that, wow, so music really does <laughs> cross, um, cross borders in the sense that, you know, I could reach a lot of people from, from different communities, uh, different countries even. So I found myself performing in Australia um, and then recently in, in Moscow, there was a Malaysian uh, revival going on there and they invited me to come and sing. So it really opened a lot of doors, um, not just in terms of getting my music heard, but also in terms of personal growth. You know, when you get out there and travel, you meet more people and um, 
your worldview starts to change a little bit. So uh, I think one of the things that was interesting was that um, when I started out, you know, I was talking about this, you know, the dominions, right? The seven areas. And I used to think that, wow, to make an impact, you've got to be the super famous Justin Bieber <laughs> or Jacqueline Victor or, do you know what I mean? It's like yeah. the whole world knows your name and yeah. then Michael Jackson and anything you say, right? Will be like, like gospel truth kind of yeah. thing. <laughs> um, and, and therefore you have this influence and, which is true in a sense, mm-hmm. but I also realized that actually you don't have to wait until you <laughs> you reach the pinnacle of success and then you go like, hey, you know what? I'm a Christian and like, wow, you should believe in Jesus, um, <laughs> which is great, you know, if that happens. <laughs> um, but I realized that a lot of times it's also in the way we relate to people, uh, mm. the way we do our work, in the way we honor our our co-workers, our colleagues, our musicians, the way we pay money, you know? Yeah, yeah, it um, yeah the, the, the timing, our, our, yeah, the way we honour people as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, so along the way, it, it kind of, it kind of changed. I, I even went through the season where I was asking God, God, you asked me to impact the marketplace, right? The, like the airwaves, right? But how come all, like half my gigs are all in church. Not half, actually. There was a time when it was 80%. They're all church. And then like, how how is this impacting the marketplace, you know? So you have these detours. You have these um, questions in your head. Um, I remember this time that I was really, really struggling with God. I was like, God, you know, crying and all that, like going to sleep. You know, I don't get it. It's like, look at my calendar. It's like, it's like, did I do something wrong? And I'm like, on the wrong track, you know. And the next morning, I got a call to say, would you be interested to, to perform on David Foster and Friends? And I'm Ooh. like, are you serious? <laughs> and right at the back of my mind, it's like, God was telling me, ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> you know, do you think I can not, you know, do you think I'm not able to do hmm. what I can do kind of thing? Wow. When, um, when was this David Foster and Friends? This was about two years ago. Um... Uh, it was the same year that we had uh, the airplane entry uh, MH370. Yes, I can't remember which. There were two. It was in March, so yes, MH370. Yeah, yeah, that was the the time. So I remember it was supposed to be an outdoor concert and everything, but because of the tragedy, uh, it got transferred into an indoor thing. Right. Um, for me, you know, that was God really, really telling me that hey, I'm in control, you know. And then I had this wardrobe scare. I'm like. Oh no, what am I going to wear? <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah. I thought, why would I remember? Yeah, that happened too, but yeah. <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> On the same gig, but yes. <laughs> um, and in the end, I had not one, but two wardrobe sponsors. Oh, wow. And again, it was like, because I was telling God, you know, that just the night before, I'm like, God, you said that, you know, you clothe even the flowers and the sparrows have, you know, never go hungry. Yeah. And why am I worrying about what to wear for the possibly biggest gig in my life, right? right? Yes. It just seems so incredible. I should be thinking about, oh, what song? And how I'm going to sing this song. But no, my greatest worry is what to wear. And so again, he pulled through. I'm like, haha, two sponsors. And I had to worry about two dresses. I went to wear which one? Because like, <laughs> yeah, I don't even know, you know, like, do I have time to change? You know, right? <laughs> and uh, it's, Women it's, problems. Yes, it's through these little things that, you know, God always like pops in and like throws, you know, this huge... Humorous <laughs> miracle. I'm still in control. <laughs> don't worry. Yes. So nowadays, um, I do realize that I think because he has opened doors for me to to have songs on radio. When I sing in church, I realize that people are, you know, people are a lot more open to coming. People who've never been to church before. It's a. It's like you know, if you hear a familiar name, mm-hmm. like oh hey, yeah, I've heard that name. I've heard that song on radio before. Let's go check it out. Right. You know, so in a way, I'm comfortable with being that that bridge, so to speak, or that bait, so to speak. But, um, but I think when people come, they they sense the love of God, they sense the presence of God, and um, yeah. So I, even now, you know, I I see how how God moves, and it, it's way beyond what I thought it would be like. Um, yeah. So you, instead of using instead of going through what you thought was the traditional route, you singing outside you it was still you using you in your in the church setting yeah bringing other lost sheep over to the church yeah yeah it's an interesting one yeah i <laughs> N- would never thought of you, I you never, never thought, thought of it, of it yeah, right? yeah yeah then from here um is that your calling from here on ah uh, you know i used to think that your calling is that 
one main thing. It it, it is, I suppose. I, I do right now I'm hearing this phrase which is a voice to the nation. Um I'm still trying to figure out what that means. <laughs> I'm seeing it happen in bits and pieces. Um my songs have kind of changed. If you look at my earlier songs, it was a lot about my personal experiences, my difficulties, God, you are with me through the darkest time. Um, my more recent songs are a little bit more of a reflection of what I see happening around me, uh, what's happening in Malaysia, uh, what's happening in different, I don't know, in marriages. <laughs> in, so it's different. There's still that element of me. I've got, you know, the unrequited love song in there as well. But there's songs like, Bell of the Ball, Light the Fire, which talks more about, hey people, let's get up already and do something. Um, so that's that's changed a little bit, you know. Uh, and uh, I'm seeing also music um, as, a, as a bigger thing, uh, bringing people together uh, in nation building, um, which again is a whole different story altogether. But yeah, so as time evolves, uh, I see things happening uh, things evolving, different doors opening, the different impact that music uh, can have, um, not just in a personal in a person's life, but in you know in in business even or or in the country. So yeah, okay. I'm still waiting for that to unfold. Oh, in f- oh, I'm sure there'll be a huge phase when that comes. I'm seeing how God has really brought you um, through the many many years. Right, it's basically it's basically um, um, what's to call it nurtured. It, it sounds from from it sounds like he's nurtured you from from a young age to to even now and continuing to be in your I continuing to grow. Yeah, I think you know one step leads to another, one door leads to another door, mm-hmm. and so what I've always believed in is that you be faithful in the little thing that he's bringing you through, and sometimes you don't know why you're doing this, but you will see it in you know a couple of years time, and you look back you're like oh, so that's why that had to happen. That's why. <laughs> and that makes a lot of sense. And you just look and like, wow, God, you're pretty amazing. <laughs> Would that be then your word for anybody who's possibly you know, pursuing a career in music or going the same route that, that you have? Yeah, I think, you know, work on your craft. Um, be open to possibilities. You know, sometimes we tend to box ourselves in to what we think is that main thing. Um, and sometimes it's not a, you know, a conscious thing. It's just we're human, right? So what we think is the thing, we run after it. Um, but give your best, give your best and continue to honour God, honour the people around you. And, you know, the people and God will honour you back in return. Amen. That's great testimony. <laughs> Thank you so much, Juita. Thank you for, for having me. For, having, uh, for being with us. And here are Jew and Jew signing off. <laughs> See ya. God bless. In the heart of sleepy town Reminiscent old battleground A tempest rages, thunders roar Teardrops ricochet off the ground At the center of it all so oblivious in your spoil Naval gazing, there you smile Shadow dancing to wild applause Oh, beautiful Blessed daughter, innocent Sweet September, bell of the ball it all when did you fall into cold December? You're not the girl that I remember. Bell of the ball, you could still have it all. Oh, aren't you tired? Empty promises, shifty eyes How do you sleep, you old, you swore You've become the one you so despised Oh, beautiful, blessed daughter, innocent Sweet September But you are stronger
This segment's episode features music by Juita Suito. Today's episode is recorded, edited and mixed by Moses Chan at Proto Studio. We would love to hear from you, especially if you have a testimony to share. Write to us at hello at rima.rad.io. Stream or download new episodes weekly on Friday evening. Don't miss out on a sermon Garment of Praise by Pastor Josh Kelsey from City Harvest Church KL on 12th of March 2017 in the next segment. God bless! I found it on Rima Radio.